Good morning, everybody. It's bright and early. The sun has just come up a few minutes ago. It's kind of cloudy and gross outside. We're gonna go and dig around on the lawn and take a look at what we can find and talk about what we find in there. And it's gonna be really super fun. So let's go get our hands dirty and roll that intro. What's up, everybody? soil you are missing out on one of the finest parts of life so I have a predominantly clay soil here um, if you go back and look at my uh, soil series I actually did a part where I showed my soil test and um, you can look back and see what we're dealing with uh, here as far as my soil is concerned and um, so with that, you know, you get a little bit more of a uh, sort of a sticky feel. If you guys obviously are familiar with clay, it can roll really easily into your fingers, form little balls like that. But what you'll notice about this soil more than anything else is even though it's clay, you can see how aggregated it is and actually how crumbly that is when you take a look at the overall picture. So it's very, very airy. But obviously that has a lot to do with all the roots that you see in here. That's coming, this is something I dug down deeper than, than just here. So you can see how this clay kind of, it doesn't stay super stuck together. And that's mainly just because of all this organic matter and rooting and all of the different aggregation that's inside here. A little baby earthworm right there. It's gonna be hard to see. It's right there moving around. So that's a fun project that you can do by yourself if you're a person who does things by themselves or with your kids or whatever, to go out and grab those little, little itty bitty earthworms. You can find them crawling around in there. I've still got one in the cup right here. I gotta get him back on the soil. It's just a little, little itty bitty guy. Uh, I probably killed that one. So let's talk a little bit about these guys. What are they really doing? Why are they here? What's happening in the soil? This is so freaking cool to watch that. It's springtime, so everything's coming active. And I think it's really important to just think about that for a second. Now it is still, again, it's still super cold. Uh, in the 40s today, we're gonna have a little bit of a warm-up coming not much kind of a return to winter again It looks like in a week or so. So I mean my lawn's moving along pretty well um, uh, Here's what it looked like last year at this time So you can see there's kind of a big difference uh, last year I burned the whole thing down I, I like raked all of the dead grass together and I lit it on fire It was really super fun uh, I don't recommend that to everybody. It's a little dangerous, uh, but you know, it was fun for me. So right now everything is just waking up. The soil is very cool here still. It's still in the 40s uh, as far as the soil temperature goes. Um, I, if you haven't done it already, kind of a, a fun tool to take a look at. Um, Alan put out his uh, Yard Mastery app uh, right here. It's got an awesome uh, soil temperature uh, 
reading for your area, which is kind of nice, and I think it actually said mine was like 43 degrees right now. All you have to really think about is this, is everything in the wintertime slows down. Everything goes to sleep, everything is tired, everything takes this moment to rest over the wintertime. Trees go to sleep, evergreens, even though with their color, are just quietly waiting towards spring. The soil life really does go to sleep, and that would include your earthworms and things like that. So when the soil temperatures get cold, everything just takes a rest. As soil temperatures increase, all of the soil life begins to wake up. And that's really what's triggering all the responses in the chemicals or fertilizers that you might be putting out first thing in the springtime. So there are a few things that are stable in colder temperatures like nitrogen because bacteria aren't breaking that down so that's kind of good but you need a bacterial interface with products like prodiamine to help work down into the soil and you need even higher temperatures for certain weed killers to work and so everything requires this certain temperature range that's not what this is about this is actually about the soil life side of it so this year so far i've only done my aerate app and my humic app and the grass woke up really early activity started early uh, again, good exposure. So on sunny days and with the grass being super short, there's not a ton of insulation, but you could see how deep the roots are. The soil is very moist right now. It's also very arable and, and crumbly and it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's like exactly how I would want it to be coming into this time of year. I'm actually really surprised how green it is. It's kind of, it's pretty shocking. But again, this is the first year that I ever uh, put it to bed at a half inch and then I've actually mowed it twice already at a half inch and it's going to be due again in another couple of days because the grass is growing it's just growing really super slow right now um, and i'll be coming up into my first nitrogen feeding i would say within about uh, maybe two weeks now with the snow and the cold that's coming back to earthworms got sidetracked i apologize here we have these creatures that are down in the soil what's their job the job is to eat your soil eat your soil digest it compost it take a big fat worm dump and leave some really good goodies behind. Their castings have a polymeric compound. They have humic acid as part of their makeup. They are leaving nitrate behind. Now, if you were to take a healthy soil field and take a look at about an acre of ground, you probably have around, I don't know, maybe 700 pounds of worm excrement somewhere in that range that's going to be happening which i think things take a little time to get through that tunnel the point is there is a lot happening underground now <clears throat> when you take a look at worm castings and you look at what its actual agronomic value is it's similar to a lot of manures it's very low on the nitrogen side maybe around one percent maybe you know if you're able to concentrate that stuff and get it but that's something if you were to take and break that out over the entirety of a property uh, you know you do have something happening under the soil that's creating some in for both the microbial life which is going to give it some energy as well and for your plant roots to go down and dive deeper obviously another thing that worms are really good at is aerating your soil and if you see them and you dig in your soil that's a really good sign because they are working and they're aerifying your soil on a regular basis for those of you that might see the mounds that pop up where they're sort of pushing up out of the ground that is really a sign that you have a more compacted soil and they're really kind of alleviating some of that compaction by pushing up through the surface layer and opening up some of that soil to respirate. So that's something to really pay attention to. So as your earthworms begin to build up and you get this population in the soil, it's fantastic. And there are certain things that you'll have to watch out for going down the line that could potentially impact them. And these would be some of those items. Number one, high salt fertilizers. Again, that is damaging to so many things in the soil, <clears throat> microbes. Uh, earthworms, you know, beneficial fungi, all of these things function in an area where if there's too much of a salt load, they can't really do their jobs. And you sort of get this like um, stasis effect where, where it's not really doing a whole lot of benefit and everything's sort of static. Uh, and it's not necessarily a great thing. It's not a terrible thing because there are things you can do to get rid of and flush salts out. But that's something to be mindful of when you're fertilizing uh, in general. So another thing to look out for is any of your grub control products. Grub control products will knock back earthworm populations, absolutely. So it's something to pay attention to, and you'll need to sort of re-nourish your lawn to get them sort of encouraged to come back. And honestly, that doesn't take a whole lot of time. 
Uh, by the time the residual of that active ingredient is gone, there should be more soil life kind of balancing itself back out and, and coming back into that space. But it is something to be aware of when you are applying some of those chemicals that it will have outside of effects beyond just the target pest. Let's say that you do have to go out and put a grub treatment down and you go ahead and wipe out some populations of some worms and your grubs and everything else. Well, here's the thing that will end up being a beneficial food to the soil anyway. So when you do have some sort of a die off of something that's living in the soil, it turns into food for more soil life. So it's not like it's this horribly detrimental thing, you know, reconcile that with your own conscience, but this is something that is part of nature. If there is a die off, they turn into food. They turn into food for the lawn, they turn into food for the microbes, they turn into food for everything that's happening underground, and that's not a bad thing, but just watch it. So another thing you could look at here with, with getting a good benefit of earthworms in the soil is the water holding capacity plus the drainage plus the root pathways. There's three huge things just right there. So when I'm talking about worm castings, I'm not talking about adding worm castings to the soil. I'm talking about what they are doing in the soil and what they are leaving in the soil, and that's really what we want. One of the reasons that worm castings was such a big push, and maybe it still is, I'm not really sure, in lawn care people were putting that out because they didn't have the worm populations that they needed. So they were having to put out the benefit of the worm and not have the worm. And that, people having worms, I feel like I shouldn't say that. Doesn't matter. But that's kind of backwards to me. If you can encourage the soil and you can create this organic matter, this sort of oasis for worms to hang out in and, and grow and do what they're supposed to do, you don't need to add that particular material to your grass in order to get the benefit. So that's really all I had for you today. I just wanted to show and, and have a little fun out in the yard, just digging down in the soil, getting your hands dirty, and getting out there and playing. I think it's really super important. Just get your hands dirty, get your kids' hands dirty, get out in your lawn, dig around, see what's happening under there, and don't just pull the soil up and say nothing. Break it apart. Feel it in your hand. Smell the earth. Okay. I really think that that's important. What are you seeing, feeling, smelling, sensing from all of this stuff that we're doing as we're nurturing the soil along to create these, these beautiful landscapes. Okay. So it's not just about how the grass looks. The grass is going to look amazing if your soil looks amazing as well. So that's really all I have for today. I hope you guys have an awesome week, and I'll talk to you real soon. See ya.